So Jim Harbaugh wins the college national championship. John Harbaugh is favored to win the Super Bowl. Right? Don't we mostly think that? Baltimore played San Francisco, blew them out. Wouldn't that be unique? Brothers, one wins the college natty, one wins the Super Bowl. John Harbaugh is the last non-offensive head coach standing in the league. The last one. Three offensive coaches and John Harbaugh. And there is a distinction. He is not a defensive coach. He's a culture creator. John Harbaugh started with running backs and tight ends coaching him. Then he went to the secondary, most years in special teams. There is a distinction. He is not Sean McDermott, Bill Belichick, Mike Tomlin, Ron Rivera, a pure 100% defensive head coach that can struggle with changes offensively. Not John. He got to Baltimore. First year, they got him Joe Flacco. By the fifth year, he won a Super Bowl, and it was a top-10 offense. That team was not about defense. That Super Bowl team was about Joe Flacco getting red hot, 11 touchdowns, no picks in the playoffs. John Harbaugh can't be pigeonholed. Tomlin, Belichick, Rivera, McDermott can. Great at what they do, but John Harbaugh and the Harbaugh's are different. Then John Harbaugh, as Flacco ages and regresses, they get him Lamar Jackson. And what's different about that is he's a completely different player. From a slower-footed pocket guy with a big arm to an absolute world-class playmaker who has now developed into an excellent pocket passer. Two different styles. John Harbaugh now favored to win a Super Bowl with both. Two totally different quarterbacks. And that's what separates the Harbaugh's. Let's talk about Jim. Despite being a quarterback and viewed as an offensive coach, did you watch Michigan? They barely threw the ball down the field. Why are they beating Ohio State? It's not because of their clever, progressive offense and their McVay and Mike McDaniel motions. The scheme of Shanahan. He, too, is a culture creator. Michigan is what Stanford was and what the Niners were, tough and physical at the point of attack. In fact, if you go back to Jim San Francisco teams, they had four top 10 defenses. No top 10 offenses. This is what separates the Harbaugh's from even the great coaches. I love Andy Reid. He's an offensive coach and acknowledges it. He gives Spags the defense. Belichick's a legend, but he's tone deaf, Jurassic, out of touch offensively. Jim Harbaugh cannot be pigeonholed as an offensive coach. Michigan was about their defense. That's why they're beating Ohio State. The Niners were about their defense. Stanford went from a dog to tough. Not saying Andrew Luck couldn't play, but it wasn't dynamic offenses. It was their physicality. And that's what transcends time. I was on the phone two nights ago with an NFL executive who said, Ben Johnson's a great play caller. He may be a great play designer, but is he a culture creator? That's what the Harbaugh's are. And that's why they transcend time. Cultures and physicality transcend time. And why many of the defensive coaches look like they're past their prime it doesn't matter how the rules change with Jim Harbaugh or John that's the separator the last non-offensive coach standing John Harbaugh and the first coach big time coach the Chargers potentially will have in over a decade Jim Harbaugh their leading candidate that's what separates the Harbaugh's they're not one side of the ball Guys, doesn't matter if you're a CEO, a high school principal, or a football coach. It's hard to pigeonhole them. John Harbaugh's offenses won him a Super Bowl, and it's Lamar now. Not saying the defense isn't great, but it's Lamar's explosiveness that defines the team. And with Harbaugh, it was Michigan's toughness. They're just different cats, and both are great. So years ago, 
a really smart person who wouldn't want to take credit told me something. I remember this clear as day in New York at a restaurant. And the person said to me, whenever you get in crisis in life, be careful about blaming. Sometimes we get in our own way. And I always think about that. Life doesn't go perfect. My wife and I are arguing. Vacation goes sideways. Job isn't perfect. Be careful about blaming. Sometimes you get in your own way. Let's talk Packers. It's very interesting. So when Aaron Rodgers acknowledged and admitted, hey, I'm going to leave and I'll go to the Jets. We know Aaron didn't leave for fame. He was already famous. We know he wasn't tired of Green Bay because of the money. He was rich. He's not going to make any more money in New York. In fact, I think he took a little less, didn't he? He wasn't going to New York for power either. He was the most powerful person in Wisconsin that wasn't in government. So when Aaron was unhappy in Green Bay, it wasn't for power. It wasn't for money. It wasn't for fame. He viewed Green Bay at some level, often passively, aggressively taking shots at the front office, They were a bit of an obstacle for his success. So think about that. Why would he leave? The people are great. The fans are amazing. The stadium's full. He was famous, rich, and powerful. I mean, Green Bay doesn't have an owner. He's the most powerful quarterback in the league. He's a Packer quarterback. So he viewed, these guys don't quite get me. They're a little bit of an obstacle. And that's where we pivot now to Jordan Love. 65% of teams that score first in the NFL win. The magic sauce, the secret sauce for the Packers this year, wasn't just their personnel. They became the best first quarter team in the league since week nine. In Jordan Love's first year of starting, their first quarter pocket passer rating, excuse me, Jordan Love's passer rating the first quarter, 108 No first quarter picks. That's the scripted half of football. Aaron Rodgers' first quarter passer rating last year, 20 points lower, 88. Three first quarter picks. Jordan Love was a significantly better first quarter quarterback this year than Aaron Rodgers, the Hall of Famer, was last year. The Packers had only four turnovers in the entire first half, the scripted half, lowest in the league. And that's a first-year starting quarterback and the youngest roster in the NFL. Last year, they were tied for 27, 13 first-half turnovers. Again, the scripted quarter, the scripted half. Mahomes does his own thing, magically, after half. But Mahomes follows a script in the first drive and maybe the second. Since week nine, Jordan Love and the Packers were plus 47. Best in the league, plus minus. Last year, entire season with Aaron, plus one. Middle of the pack. It was interesting watching the Packers. Aaron didn't leave for money. He didn't leave for power. And he didn't leave for fame. He left because at some level, he viewed Green Bay as a bit of an obstacle to his success. He was the obstacle. Green Bay became the best first quarter offense. They took the lead in Dallas. They put the pressure on San Francisco. The team that scores first wins almost 65% of the time. Aaron, as Greg Cosell has told us multiple times, audibles out. Aaron's out of successful plays. More of a jazz musician going to his own beat. Certainly earned it. But it is interesting. When you watched Green Bay, especially from about week eight and nine on, they were taking the lead on people in the scripted half, allowing himself to be coached, allowing himself to be guided. Jordan Love did not view Matt LaFleur as an obstacle, but as an assistant to his success. Hi, everybody. It's me, Uncle Colin. Subscribe here to get the latest from the herd, including exclusive behind-the-scenes videos and more wherever you may be, however you may be watching. Thanks again for making us part of your day.